Welcome to Northwest Church Online. Thank you so much for tuning in. As you watch the message today, you can access the notes and follow along in the link in the description. Thank you again for joining us. Let's jump into the message. And today we're continuing our series, If You Know, You Know. How many of you have heard that phrase before, if you know, you know? Now, I want to add to that, if you don't know, you need to know. So if you know, you know, and if you don't know, then you need to know today. Well, in our culture, there is much value placed on some what people know or what someone may know about a particular subject or skill. Typically, people obtain knowledge through education or experience. In fact, studies show it takes a person 10,000 hours dedicated to a certain skill in order to become a master of that skill. So if you want to become a master of anything, no problem. It's only going to take you 10,000 hours to do that. Doctors and attorneys and professors invest many years into education and training to prepare for their respective fields. You can become an expert or know all there is to know on a particular subject, trade, or skill. But for us as Christ followers, we will never know, at least while we're on earth, all there is to know about who Christ is. I want to say that again. We are not ever going to know all that we need to know about who Christ is. So regardless of how much you study, regardless of your education, regardless of your experience, if you have little, no, or a lot of experience with Christ, there will always be more to know about Christ. And if anyone in the New Testament might be considered an expert or a master when it came to knowing Christ, it would be the Apostle Paul. In his own words, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, flawless with the law of God from the tribe of Benjamin. But here in his letter, Paul is near the end of his life. He's writing from a prison cell. He's had a personal encounter with Christ. He has seen, he has performed miracles. He has had visions. He has received direct revelation from Christ himself. Yet compared with all he thought he knew, he penned these words in Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading in verse 7. Are you guys ready for this? Here we go. Paul says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. That word garbage, I want you to underline that. I want you to circle that or highlight that because this is a unique word. And what I mean by that, to my knowledge, it's the only place it's mentioned throughout the Bible, or at least in the New Testament, the word garbage. And it comes from a Greek word, uh, skubalon. And skubalon, again, it's the only time it's used in the New Testament, and it simply refers to human waste. That's for all of you people who are thinking about having lunch while I'm standing up here preaching the word to you. But Paul writes this because this is the worst image that he could create in the minds of his readers, meaning all of this I count as garbage, as human waste. Y'all still with me on this? Now, let's look at verse 9. I appreciate all those good amens right there. Verse 9, here we go. Are y'all ready? And become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself, it depends on faith. But I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Look at verse 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Verse 13, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. This is really good. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. What a powerful passage of Scripture. So in a culture that's filled with self-proclaimed experts, 
even with theology, we must have a heart like the Apostle Paul that says that I want to know him. I want to know him, meaning I want to know Christ, and I want to know more about Christ. This is relevant if this is the first time you've ever come to, to a church. This is relevant if you've been in church your entire life and you can quote the entire Bible. It is still relevant because all of us should have the desire that the Apostle Paul has that we want to know Christ and we want to know him in an intimate way. And the more that we know him, the more it should create a desire to get to know him even more. So what does that look like? I want to give you three things this morning. It's in your notes. Three takeaways from this passage. Are you guys ready for this? Here we go. Number one, let's talk about their pursuit of Christ. Their pursuit of Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 says... I want to know Christ, yes, to know, and I want you to circle that word, I'm going to talk about it in a moment, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, when you think about this, these are really bold words considering that Paul is in a prison cell waiting to hear of his fate. Even in the isolation and pain of prison, nothing to lose but his life, The cry of his heart was still, I want to know Christ, and I want to know more about Christ. When you think about it, was this not the same guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? Is this not the same guy who God chose in his one to plant churches across Asia Minor and Europe? Did he not tell the Corinthian church that he was caught up in the third heaven? Did he not also say that I speak in tongues more than all of you? Paul could have easily be described as someone who knew Christ in a very personal and in a very intimate way. What was left to know? Well, the truth is that God is so incredible. He is so indescribable that there will always be more to know, more to discover about who he is. Now, if that were not true, he would not be God. Paul didn't just want to know more about Christ. He wanted to know more of Christ. Now, the Greek word for the word know there in this passage, it's an intimate word, and and it means to know on many different levels. So Paul is saying, I want to, he's coming to the end of his life. And think about all the experiences that he's had with Christ, all of the miracles, the visions, all the things that we talked about, the planting of churches, the personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So he's had all of these great experiences with Christ, Yet he comes to the end of his life and his heartbeat is and his heart cry is, I want to know more about who Christ is. Meaning I want to know him on many different levels. Think of it this way, your best friend or spouse, someone you know very very well, and regardless of how long you've been friends or married, there is still more to know. There's still more to know about your friend or your spouse. And when you get to know someone, you're going to know things like their likes. You're going to know their dislikes. You're going to know what interests them. You're going to know what annoys them. Sometimes that's you. But then it's another thing when you intimately know them. Mean you know their scars, you know their hurts, you know their feelings, you know their memories, you know what makes them cry, what makes them sad, and what makes them happy. But if you do not continue to pursue, then that relationship can become stale or stagnant. Now remember, this is not a trick question today, so let's do this today. Look, this is going to require a little participation, not much. How many of you can remember. Now, first of all, guys, let me help you out because we need some help. So let me give you a heads up. All the guys in the room this morning, if you're married, you need to raise your hand on this one. How many of you can remember dating your spouse? (laughs) You clarify that. How many of you can remember dating your spouse? And I, you know, I can remember those days and and I've heard guys talk about it. And those kind of days, you would take off work early yeah, you would even take a shower. You would even stop by and like wash your car or truck or clean it out. You would do all of those things. Why? Because throughout the day, there was this excitement and there was this anticipation 
that you saw this girl and you, she walked by and you're like, hey, 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 I want to get to know her and I want to know more about her. And because you wanted to know more, you put forth some effort and there was some anticipation on your part because you were looking forward to hanging out with her that night to knowing her more. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? That's right. You did all that. You even showed up on time. Nobody had to remind you or tell you what time to be there. Why? Because you wanted to know more about her. Now, the guys come home. They sit in a chair. They say, what's for dinner? Get out of the way. You're blocking the TV. <laughs> come on, ladies. Give me a hand this morning. I'm trying to help you out today. Lord, I'm trying to help all of you. Y'all are not helping me. You're just leaving me out here. Here's my point. Where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ? And I want this word to be encouraging today, but I want it to cut on us a little bit today. I want it to penetrate your heart. I want it to get beyond the surface of your heart. Where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Meaning, do you still have a desire to pursue him? Has the pursuit stopped? Come on, after you received salvation, did you stop the dating process? Meaning, did you stop pursuing him? I want to encourage you today. The pursuit should never stop after you get married, and the pursuit should never stop after you accept Jesus Christ as Savior of your life. You should continue to pursue him. Do you still look forward to serving Jesus? Do you still look forward to serving on a serve team? Do you still get excited about Sunday mornings? Or do you wake up going, oh, I got to go because if I don't go, Pastor Joe's going to see me at Walmart and he's going to get mad at me. Or do you, or you get excited about still coming to church? That was the Apostle Paul. He's at the end of his life. He's had some radical encounters with Jesus. And he says, but I still want to know more about Jesus. That should be our desire today. And you know what? In the world that we live in, we need to know Christ in a personal way. Moms and dads, your children need to see Jesus in your life. They need to see, see you pursuing Christ in a personal and an intimate way. They need to know that Christ is a priority. That going to church is a priority. That tithing and serving is a priority. They need to see that in your life. We need to continue to pursue Christ. It doesn't matter if you're brand new today as a Christ follower or you've been doing this in your entire life. The word is the same for us today. Let's pursue Christ in a real way. Number two, progress in Christ or progress in Christ. Paul wanted the Philippians to know here. I'm not saying I've got all this figured out, but in verse 12 he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But he says, I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Y'all want something free today? Here it goes. Even if you know a lot of things, let me say it this way. Just because you know a lot of things don't mean you know everything. Oh, that sounded good. Just because you know. Y'all with me? Y'all want another freebie? It's better to know that you don't know everything than to really not know anything but think you know everything. There are a lot of people that fit in that bucket. Don't be looking around the room. Just keep your eyes focused right here. There's a lot of people that don't know anything that think they know everything. Let's just leave all those people in a bucket right there, okay? Because even if you look at them, they're going to think it's somebody else. If you feel you don't know much of anything when it comes to Christ, the good news is you can always begin by learning something. So don't let the feeling of knowing nothing about Christ prevent you from taking the first step in knowing something about Christ. That's the whole point of discipleship. That's the whole point of experiencing God is to continue to progress and to make progress in growing in your knowledge of him. Paul's word here, it's not a passive passage. It's not a passive group of words. It is, it's, a, it's an active, it, it, it's an act, it's words filled with action here. It's not a passive plan. He says, I press on. In essence, I keep going. Now, this is especially important when it feels like that you have more headwind than tailwind. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's amazing to me. You can fly the same distance. You can fly from here to Dallas. 
And sometimes you can fly there in 45 minutes, turn around and get on the plane and come back and take an hour and a half. The difference is headwind and tailwind. It's easy when you got tailwind in life. Meaning, you know what? Chest is stuck out. You're kind of strutting. The kids are doing great. The marriage is great. The finances are good. Your health is okay. And you got the chest stuck out. And you're like, if y'all will just listen to me, and if you all will just do what I'm doing, you'll have perfect kids like me, and you'll have a perfect life like me. It's one thing when you got tailwind, but sooner or later, you're going to turn a corner, and you're no longer going to have that tailwind, and you're going to be facing some headwind. And in that headwind, in that resistance, anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever felt like as soon as you got serious with God, the devil decided to get serious with you? <laughs> when it feels like it's uh, one step forward and two steps back. When you just start serving at church and it feels like all oh, hell has broke loose in your life. And then you started tithing and now you're facing all these unexpected financial setbacks. It's just like, what in the world is going on? Or you start 15 and a half days of prayer and you're like gun ho you're excited and you're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pray all 15 and a half days. And on day three, you've already missed two. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but he, progress isn't about starting at all. It's about staying at it. That's what it is. It's about staying at it. Don't give up on Christ. Why? Because he has not given up on you. You have to press on because progress isn't always obvious. I want you to write that down. That's just good. Let's just stop. Just stop. It's so good. Let that marinate for a moment. Progress is not always obvious. Now look at me for a moment. This is true in your personal life. This is true in all of your relationships. This is true in your business. This is true in your finances. Progress isn't always obvious. Most progress in life, especially our spiritual lives, it is subtle and it's slow. Meaning the results of doing the unseen things, the prayer, the Bible reading, the fasting, they are not quickly seen. Jesus talks about this with the farmer. He says the farmer goes out, plants the corn, and then he likes the next day, like, where's the corn? How foolish would that be? I'm trying to say all of this progress, sometimes it's not obvious. The point is you need to be focused on the process, not the progress. Because progress is not always obvious, meaning if you're only focused on the progress, what's going to happen when you're going into the headwind and you're doing all the right things, you're tithing, you're serving, you're giving, you're doing everything the right way, but you see no progress. There will be seasons in your life in which you see no progress. There are seasons in your business you see no progress. There are seasons in the church where sometimes it's hard to find progress. And in those moments, you got to realize, I am focused on the process. Because if my process is pure, the progress, the end result is going to take care of itself. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? I'm trying to help all of us. So press on. Keep going. Because sometimes progress isn't obvious, it's subtle, and it's slow. The key is to simply press on. Progress, is, it's inevitable when we press on. Not saying that you're not going to hit a few roadblocks. Let me help you out. You're going to hit some roadblocks. You're going to hit some seasons in your life. You're going to hit some seasons in your marriage. We have seasons in this church that I think, what is going on? It's just part of it sometimes. But you got to stay, come on guys, you got to stay glued in. And you, you got to stay focused on finishing this race. Because a lot of people today quit their marriage, they quit their jobs, they quit their church, they're quitting Christ, and they're walking away. I say everybody can quit but us, but we cannot quit. We got to keep moving forward. Pressing, what does that mean? Proverbs 24 and 16 says the godly may trip seven times. The word seven is the number, by the way, for completeness. But they will get up again. I like that. You're going to fall down. You're going to fall down in your marriage. You're going to fall down in your finances. You're going to fall down in your business. You're going to fall down serving. You're going to have some times you're going to fall down. The point is, are you going to stay down or are you going to get back up? So here's what you got to do. You got to make up your mind. I know the more I walk with Christ, I'm going to fall. 
And when I fall, I'm going to get back up. When I make a mistake, I'm going to get back up. When I encounter sin, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to get at it again. Those are the people that are going to win in the end. Those who refuse to give up. It's not what we talk about doing that matters, but what we actually do that matters. Progress with Christ is not a matter of talking about getting closer to him, but actually getting closer to him. We do not know him fully, but one day we're going to know him. And I want you to lean in and hear my heart today. We've got to finish. Whether we see progress or not does not excuse us getting out of the process. So even when you're facing resistance, you got to keep moving. And when it feels like there's no tangible evidence of change and what you're doing, you don't see the evidence of that. You don't, see any, you don't see any evidence that something is changing and what you're doing is actually working. That's when you gotta know, I gotta press on. I gotta keep moving. Because sometimes progress is subtle and it's slow. Y'all still with me? And those people, number three, it's in your notes this morning. Let's talk about the prize of Christ. Verse 14, Paul says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Progress eventually leads us to a prize. The great reward of this race is not just heaven, but it's Christ. Heaven is not just great because we're going to one day reunite with our lost loved ones. Now, let me stop. All of us have lost loved ones. We have friends who have already gone on to be with the Lord. And some of us, one day, will see children again, grandchildren again. Some of us are going to see mom and dad or our grandparents all over again. Some of us are going to see mom, dad. We're, we're going to see a spouse. We're going to see what a day that's going to be. The Bible describes that, that we all who are alive, when the trumpet's going to sound, we are going to be caught up in the air. We're going to meet Jesus in the air. He's coming back with all of those who have died before us. What a great reunion that's going to be. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you you see your loved ones for the first time and give them a, can you can you even begin to imagine or visualize what that what that reunion is going to be like when you see lost loved ones again but that's not going to be the greatest thing about heaven that's going to be great but the greatest thing about heaven is going to be when you and I come face to face with Jesus Christ and we see the one who purchased us with his blood who said I'm not going to give up the one who reached down the seventh time to pick you up up after you fell for the seventh time, when everybody gave up, when everybody walked away, Jesus was the one who said, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to walk away. We're going to see him face to face and be with him forever and ever and ever and ever again. That's the prize of not giving up. I want to tell you, not everybody's going to get a trophy. Oh, the disappointment I can feel it in the room. You've been told all your life, if you participate, you're going to get a trophy. Let me tell you something. There's no participation trophy in following Christ. True. Let me help you. Can I just be honest with you today? You're not going to get a participation trophy for following Christ. The only trophy you're going to get, the only prize you're going to get is if you finish this race here on earth. And we've got to finish it. If we're not, we're not going to get a participation trophy. We're not going to get one at all. The prize of heaven is Jesus Christ. He awaits those who finish the race. We are going to receive him one day and he will receive us. You know, the devil, the devil's a master at throwing some unexpected unfair and unexplainable things in life at us. Have you ever noticed that? It's the devil. They're only there to serve as a distraction. I know it's that way at church. You know, you, you, you look at numbers and different things, and it's just the devil just throws things at you all the time as a distraction. To try to discourage you. That's what he tries to do to you every Sunday morning. He tries to talk you out of coming to church and listening to Pastor Joe spit and yell at you. But I get it. Many days can come with more questions than answers. There are many days we have more fear than we have faith. More losses than we have wins. Heaven can seem like a dream. Heaven can seem like a dream because here can feel like a nightmare. But God never told us that we would know or even understand everything. That's for later. 
Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. He says, we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with, perfectly clear, with perfect clarity. And that I know now is partial. And what I know now is partial. It's incomplete. But then, he's referring to heaven, I will know everything completely. Just as God now knows me completely. You know, we have good intentions. We say crazy things. We say things like, well, when I get to heaven, I, I'm going to ask Jesus this. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to go over and ask the Apostle Paul why he wrote this. And when I get to heaven, I, I'm going to like sit in the lap of Jesus and I'm going to have him explain this. Or I'm going to have him explain that. Let me help you. When you get to heaven, you're not going to have any questions. Because when you get to heaven, you're going to know everything that you need to know about Christ and about who he is. But, but you've got to hear my heart today. You can't stop now. You know, to me, one of the most saddest visuals that I have in my mind are people who start fresh, start fast with Christ but because of roadblocks and discouragement, setbacks, all those kind of things, they quit and walk away. I thought all that you went through is now for nothing. Listen, the only Christ followers who are going to receive the prize in heaven and of heaven are going to be the one who finishes the race. Not the one who starts fresh, not the one who starts out the fastest, but the one who finishes. Now, I know a thing or two about getting knocked down. I know a little bit about discouragement. And I know a whole lot about sometimes feeling like you're not making any progress in life. I get that. And sometimes we just got to keep moving. And that's all I tell myself. I got to keep moving forward, trusting the process, trusting that the prize is going to wait at the end. And so I want to encourage all of you today to keep pressing on and to keep moving. So for now, choose to settle for not knowing, for knowing only what God allows you to know. That's it. What we need to know, God allows us to know. And if we don't need to know it, I don't even worry about it anymore. The prize is not knowing the what or the why, but the prize is knowing the who. That's what this is all about. That's the true prize of heaven is to know Christ. Right now, we see things imperfectly. That's why we must choose. According to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now watch this. The champion who initiates and the one who perfects our faith. The one who initiates. So it was Christ who initiated our faith. It was Christ at the point of salvation when we asked Christ to come into our life. We began a race. We started a relationship with him. So he was the initiator, initiator of our faith. He is also the perfecter of our faith. In essence, here's what the writer is saying. The race that you and I are running, he has already run with perfection. He's waiting for us at the finish line. In essence, that's what he told his disciples when he left. He said, I've shown you the way. He said, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to walk alongside of you to help you, guide you, to encourage you, to help you get back up when you fall, and I'm going to see you at the finish line again. You can't get excited about the visual of Jesus standing at the finish line at the gate of heaven, ready to welcome you. What can we get excited about? When I think about heaven, I think it's going to be worth it all. When I think about when the gates opened, come on, and you see your loved ones and all of the people who are going to be cheering for you and welcoming you home, I'm here to say that heaven is going to be worth it all. It doesn't matter the pain that you'll go through, the setbacks you have, the roadblocks you have, and all of the things that you're going to have to overcome on this earth. I'm here to declare today and tell you that it's all going to be worth it. Why? Because heaven is going to be more than just gold streets and gates of pearl, but it's going to be lost loved ones, but most of all, it's going to be 
Jesus Christ himself. I want you to know heaven will be worth the wait. It will be worth the pain. It will be worth the struggle. So you got to keep going. Heaven awaits us if we do not quit and if we do not walk away. So there's going to be no participation trophies. Only those who finish the race. Those are the ones who are going to receive a prize. So I tell myself, it's one of my prayers. I have three in my life. I'm going to get a little transparent. I want to grow, I want to grow old with Christy. Older with Christy. I'll save, I'll save some of y'all from popping me. Yeah. I want to grow older with Christy. Number two, I want to watch our grandkids grow up. I want to see that. Number three, I want to finish really strong at Northwest Church. Push back the darkness, enlarge the kingdom. That's why we're driving 10 hours a day to enlarge the kingdom of God. Because I want to finish this race that I've started. And I want you to hear my heart today. Let's finish this race. The prize of heaven awaits those who refuses to quit here. Amen. Would you, would you bow your heads this morning? What a powerful message from the Word of God. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today, if you want to make a decision to become a Christ follower, you can go to northwestchurch.tv, hit the church online tab, and send us a message. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you and help you take those next steps in your walk with Christ. Also today, make sure if this message encouraged you to share this with your friends and family, because if it encouraged you, it'll likely encourage someone else. Again, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.